Hello, star friends. You're watching Earth Sky. I'm Deborah Bird. Asteroid 2024 YR4 swept into view of the Atlas Asteroid Impact Early Warning System, which has telescopes in Hawaii, Chile, and South Africa on Christmas Day, December 25th. And as of moments ago, this space rock has a one in 83 odds of hitting the Earth in 2032. The asteroid isn't gigantic. It's about 150 feet or 50 meters wide, which that's about the same size as the asteroid that felled reindeer and flattened about a thousand square miles of forest in a remote part of Siberia in 1908. And with that said, I want to introduce our guest for today. There he is. Uh, this is Dr. Richard Benzel. He is an astronomer and professor of planetary sciences at MIT. Uh, he's a discoverer of minor planets and the inventor of the Torino impact hazard scale, which is a method for categorizing the risk associated with near Earth objects, such as asteroids and comets. Hi, Richard. Hi, uh, Debbie. It's great to see you. It's great to see you. Um, so tell us, Asteroid 2024 YR4 is causing a stir. So what's its ranking on the Torino scale and why is that ranking so exceptional? So um, the Torino scale is a basically a one to 10 scale where eight, nine or 10 are the numbers you don't want to see because those are the categorization of objects that uh, are certain to hit the earth. And so on this 10 point scale of 2024 YR4 is at three. That's a good place to be. Um, what that means is that uh, we uh, don't have enough data yet to rule out with certainty that it's going to absolutely miss the earth. Uh, we know this object will um, be coming close to the earth, just like a lot of them do. We see those as clickbait all the time. And this is just one that uh, we just haven't uh, been able to track it long enough to rule out completely that uh, it's going to be at a safe miss distance. Okay, that's good to hear. But if it's a three, uh, how many how many other asteroids on the Torino scale right oh. now are a three? Yeah, so most asteroids, in fact, all asteroids that have been discovered to date um, uh, now rest at zero or one on the Torino scale. There was an, uh, an episode uh, 20 years ago of an asteroid that reached four on the Torino scale uh, before it ultimately fell to zero. And that and, was asteroid uh, Apophis, correct? Yes, that, that was, uh, it was originally called 20, 2004 MN4. Now we call it Apophis. And we know that Apophis will make a very uh, close but safe pass by the Earth in 2029 which is actually a very exciting science opportunity uh, for studying this asteroid, but in terms of it being any hazard at all, it's, it's no threat or no hazard at all. And so Apophis, I remember when, when the big uproar about Apophis was happening and there was supposed to be this keyhole that it might pass through, I believe in 2029. And if it passed through that keyhole, it meant that it would hit the earth at, you know, a few years later, but it, is not passing through the keyhole, correct? We know now. Yeah. So no so, danger from Apophis. Right. So we've been tracking Apophis for two decades now, including with radar, you know, and that pins down its position and velocity, you know, to centimeters, if not meters. So we have incredible precision on, uh, on Apophis and where we'll be in 2029 and for centuries into the future. And uh, we, <clears throat> what we know for sure, this thing that we call a keyhole, is you know where would it have to pass so that a return uh, a return orbit would actually bring it in, uh, in in contact with the earth and it's missed all those keyholes um and when we know that with great precision and so we know the 2029 pass by apophis uh, which will be at less than a tenth of the lunar distance that's very exciting uh is a science opportunity and not a not a hazard or a worry well, so tell us about 2024 YR4. Uh, first of all, do you think it's going to get a name like Apophis? Or is there, <laughs> is there any talk about what to name it? 
<laughs> well, at some point, uh, 2024 YR4 will will get a name. Um, okay. It, it, it'll it'll keep this phone number for a while. Um, it gets a name once the the orbit is very well determined, and so that, you know that could take a while. Uh, so yes, uh, we'll, we'll see. And then the name is up to the discoverer, uh, pending the approval of the International Astronomical Union or IAU. So yeah, we'll get a name at some point. And so tell us why don't we why don't we know like why don't we know more about this asteroid? Yeah, the analogy I like to use is baseball. <clears throat> um, you're a center, you're an outfielder, <clears throat> and you hear the crack of the bat, so you know the ball is in play. And at first you don't know if it's going to left field, center field or right field, all right? And so maybe from the crack of the bat, we can tell, oh, it's gonna go to center field. And that's all we know. We're just at the crack of the bat in, ter <clears throat> in terms of um, the amount of observations we have, how far would the trajectory of the asteroid has gone. Uh, we're simply not uh, able to, um, you know calculate you know uh, where where in center field it's going to land or is it going to be at the fence do we need to leap over the fence and so we simply have to keep tracking it to to know where it's going to be and so first of all where is it now in in a physical sense like is it is it in the asteroid belt like where is it no it, it's in narrow space it's in the inner solar system which is why we were able to see it uh, in the first place. It's so small, okay. we can't see it so far away. So it's uh, basically in the vicinity of the earth. So it's observable and uh, it will be observable though it's difficult. It's a difficult observation. It's a small object, it's faint. Um, uh, but for the next month or two, uh, it should still be within the range of telescopes. And because there's interest in it, you know, those telescopes are gonna give it their very best effort. So I expect, and we're going to have a lot more data coming in in the coming uh, weeks and months. So it's it's simply an ongoing story as as we track it, you know, kind of like a hurricane where first you see a low pressure system develop in the Gulf. And yeah, OK, that's interesting. We'll track it. And we're just at this this stage of, you know, just like we don't necessarily know if a low pressure system will turn into a hurricane and where it might go. Just at that first stage where we identify that it's there. And uh, we're just going to start tracking, and and uh, as as time goes on, we'll get a better and better idea. But ultimately, so we, ultimately, we you know that the odds are greatly in our favor that it it will safely pass by the Earth. Right, uh, and as as no doubt billions of other asteroids have <laughs> over the <laughs> multi billion year history of the solar system. So, uh, but sometimes they do strike. So the asteroid in uh, nineteen oh eight that the Tunguska event, which many people know about, is about the same size as this asteroid, correct? Yes, that's about right. About 50 meters, 150 feet is our current best guess. Okay, so this is not a world-destroying sized no. asteroid. It's a small asteroid. Uh, but what kind of effect would it have if it did strike? So the, the area of devastation of Tunguska and uh, where the reindeer were felled, but no one was injured, um, was basically the size of a major city. Uh, so this is sort of a city-sized uh, problem uh, in the sense of uh, uh, if we ever got to that eventuality. Um, you know, there are a lot of uh, case studies now um, where people have looked at this, what do we do and how do we interact? And there are, in, there are international groups that uh, formulate plans or procedures in this. It's been practiced uh, in many tabletop exercises. Anyway, that group is called the Inter International Astronomical Warning Network, IAWN or I1. Everything has an acronym, and so uh, so this is in the, if if we get to the point where uh, the uh, likelihood is it becomes a certainty, uh, then the I1 would would uh, come into play in terms of helping guide what what would be a good international response. And I think that's interesting that you're talking about that because uh, Richard and I have known each other for almost 50 years. And uh, we were talking before this program about, you know, what people thought about asteroids back in the 1970s and even into the 1980s. There wasn't as much awareness back then that asteroids could collide with the Earth. We knew there had been a Tunguska event, but in the past few decades, there's been 
and increasing awareness of the possibility of asteroid collisions with Earth. But along with that awareness, there's been people out there, people of goodwill out there doing something about it, like this program that you just mentioned, where astronomers have come together again and again in workshop settings and tried to envision what might happen if an asteroid were coming to Earth. Uh, I know that they occasionally will have um, sort of trial runs of that, like simulated trial runs of what would happen on a day if an, we knew an asteroid was coming, what, you know, what are the steps that would have to be taken? And in fact, now there is the DART spacecraft mission, which uh, a couple of years ago was uh, directed toward an asteroid and deliberately crashed into an asteroid so that we could knock it off target. So tell us about that. Tell us more about that. Tell us about you know, the things that have gone on in the past few decades to keep us safe from asteroids. It's been a very fascinating history. Uh, you know, back 50 years ago, it was a giggle. You mentioned asteroid impacts, and it was a, there was a giggle factor. Um, but uh, we, you know, we've become to realize from the geologic evidence, which is overwhelming, that uh, an asteroid was the, uh, the, the imminent, uh, the ultimate demise of the dinosaurs uh, 65 million years ago. And then in 1994, we had a comet that hit Jupiter, the comet Shoemaker-Levy 9. And in fact, Gene Shoemaker, who's a very famous astronomer, was one of the pioneers in, in getting telescopic searches going. Uh, Gene was interested in craters on the moon. He wanted to know what was making the craters on the moon and what was making craters on Earth, like the meteor crater in Arizona. And so Gene really was a pioneer in, in these telescopic surveys, which now are becoming more and more plentiful. We're going to have a space-based telescopic survey called NEA. Neo, Neo Surveyor, Near Earth Object Surveyor. And we have a new survey telescope going online in Chile called the Vera Rubin Telescope, also, also called the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope, LSST. And so the awareness has come to the point where we realize we have a responsibility, we as astronomers have a responsibility to simply know what's out there. And so uh, 2024 YR4 is simply a case of astronomers uh, upping their game, if you will, upping our capabilities and being able to find objects that are going to make close approaches to the Earth many decades into the future. And so this is going to become, or become routine. Uh, as our surveys get better and better, we're going to find more, these objects that are out there that do come close to the Earth. And it's just simply a lack of knowledge at the time of discovery. It's just a lack of knowledge at the crack of the bat uh, where they're going to go. And so that's just where we are with uh, 2024 YR4. Okay. And you've mentioned that that number, so this object, 2024 YR4, is currently a three on the Torino scale, which you invented, by the way. Yeah. Good job. <laughs> I'm glad that's it's, cool. I'm, I'm, we're, we're, it, it's, it's the Torino scale and it's here to help. Yes, it's awesome. Uh, so um, it's a three right now. Correct. And so, but there is a possibility that it'll go up in risk to a four, correct? As we so, uh, refine its orbit, is that right? Or is it only going to go down? Yeah, so I expect just the way the Torino scale is built and you, know, you can look at it online and it's, it's a two dimensional space problem as you can imagine, of uh, impact probability versus uh, consequence. And so um, I expect it'll, it will stay in the category three uh, until ultimately it will fall to one or zero. And, uh, and we, as I said, we don't want it to go to eight. So, um, no. you know, ultimately, ultimately the probability is zero or one because it's a deterministic problem. And uh, right now the odds are in our favor of 80 to one that it will go away. Uh, another way I like to look at this is um, uh, with the odds of one in 80, that means we're going to have this conversation 80 times before one of them is actually um, a, a hazard to, or a threat to the earth. And okay. so, so <laughs> I'm, ready to, yeah. I'm ready to have this conversation. Yeah. 80 times. So, so this <laughs> is got, my point is this is going to become more and more routine uh, as right. our surveys get better and better. 
And you know, already we get all this clickbait about an object passing 10 times the distance of the moon. Um, that's really not helpful. Um, you know, this this is really the first time in many years that there was any asteroid story that you know was really worth um, sure. any kind of uh, discussion. So, so it's kind of frustrating. There's all that clickbait out out, out there. Um, this one is uh, you know one that we're going to watch very carefully, and that's what the uh, the number three on the Torino scale means is it merits close attention by astronomers, and that's simply where we're at. Okay. Uh, I feel reassured, but not entirely. <laughs> but uh, I know there's there's people out there working on this, and uh, it's a, it's a super interesting, super interesting situation. So, uh, Rick, thank you for joining us and and for reassuring us. Uh, I have been speaking with Dr. Richard Benzel of MIT. He's the inventor of the Torino Impact Hazard Scale for Asteroids. Uh, I also want to thank Kelly Kaiser Witt, who wrote our article about this asteroid at earthsky.org. She did a fantastic job on that. So come over there and read Kelly's article. Uh, and also we'll be putting updates uh, at that same URL. So please don't forget to hit share, like, and subscribe. I'm Deborah Bird, One Earth, One Sky, Earth Sky. <laughs>